I'd like to introduce our next speaker, our keynote speaker, Times of Uncertainty, How Do We Lead, How Do We Follow, um, Dr. Julian M. Earls, Executive in Residence, Mount Ahuja College of Business, Cleveland State University. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so I'm not Dr. Julian Earls, uh, but I'm, a, I'm a William Tarter, and um, I'm on the uh, planning committee for uh, the uh, Conference on Social Welfare. First off, thank you to everyone uh, for being here. Uh, second, thank you, John, uh, for his remarks, and um, not just because he's my boss, but also because it was a great, uh, a great conversation, very informative, and we hope that you take this message um, beyond this walls. So before we get to Dr. Earls, I have a request of everyone. We're gonna stand up and stretch. So everyone, please stand up. All right, everyone stand up. I want everyone to raise your hands up. All right, now raise them higher. All right, now you may put your hands down and you may have a seat. The reason why we do that exercise is because many times when we stretch, we think that we have stretched enough, but you can always stretch more. All right, every time you think you can stretch, you can always stretch more. So I encourage you everything that you do today I want you to take that information, I want you to stretch with it, but when you think you've stretched enough, I want you to stretch even further, even more places, even more people, even more uh, opportunities to change people's thoughts and minds and eventually the world. So thank you for that opportunity to share that thought with you. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, our keynote speaker for today. Um, I first had the honor of, of meeting Dr. Earls at a City Club event uh, a few months ago, and needless to say, it changed my whole perspective. So for those of you who have heard him before, you know uh, how dynamic of a speaker he is, and if you've not heard him before, you're in for a treat. And so uh, he inspired me, continues to inspire me, and even my glasses choice, I, I have to say. It was really, uh, is a man of, of great character and integrity. Um, Dr. Julian Earls is executive in residence at the Monta Ahuja College of Business at Cleveland State University in Cleveland, Ohio. Also, he's the founder, president, and CEO of Entrepreneurship Engagement Ohio, an organization devoted towards education of students in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and entrepreneurialism. He's the retired center director of the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland. As director of the Glenn Research Center, he managed a budget of over $750 million and a workforce of over 3,500 employees. Dr. Earls holds 11 university degrees, a BS in physics, physics an MS in radiation bio biology, an MS and a PhD in radiation physics, and eight honorary doctorates. Also, he's a graduate of the Harvard Business School Program of Management and Development. He's the author of 31 publications and received presidential rank awards from President William Jefferson Clinton and President George W. Bush. In addition, he has received three NASA awards for outstanding leadership, exceptional achievement, and distinguished service. He received distinguished alumni awards from his undergraduate college, Norfolk State University, and the University of Michigan. Dr. Earls has mentored countless students through college and the professions. He is a runner, who has completed 27 marathons, including the Boston Marathon. Yeah, I think it's worthy of applause. <laughs> he was honored to carry the Olympic torch on its route through Cleveland for the Salt Lake City 2002 Winter Olympic Games. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, Dr. Julian Earls. After that introduction, I could hardly wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> Will, I tell you something, you bring a new dimension to the term alternative facts. <laughs> uh, let me tell you something. What he left out of the introductions, I finished the rigorous discipline of physics as a major at Norfolk State University in only three terms. 
Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon were the three terms. <laughs> You see, what I want you to do is look beyond these introductions and understand there's a lot that is not said during these introductions. But let me tell you something, and these, these honorary degrees, I merely ask you, would you want an honorary physician performing quadruple bypass surgery? <laughs> I think not. Honorary is extremely nice, but earned is so much better. What a pleasure it is to be introduced by a dynamic, determined, competent, African-American male who has become one of my surrogate sons, a young man who has the creative, go ahead, give him a call. I said, Will has the creative intellect of Frederick Douglass. He has the perspicacity of W.E.B. Du Bois, the courage and determination of Kunta Kinte and the physiognomy, the classic good looks of Pharaoh Ramses II. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. <laughs> But let me tell you, I have to have rebuttal time to introductions because often people fail to keep the achievement of degrees in perspective. So the story I use to make it quite clear about the relevance of degrees relates to a plane that was about to crash. There were six people on board the plane, but there were only five parachutes. So you can imagine how the discussion followed about the distribution of the parachutes when the pilot stepped out of the cockpit, explained that it takes several million dollars to train an airline pilot many years to become competent, went on to explain that she had been flying planes for over 15 years, so it would be tragic to waste that investment in time and dollars by her dying in an airplane crash. The pilot took the first parachute and jumped out of the plane. Second person on board was President Barack Obama, who said, I am former President Barack Obama, took a parachute and jumped out of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Next person on board was President George H.W. Bush, Bush 41, who said, undoubtedly, you know my prowess with a parachute. I jumped out of a plane on my 85th birthday and again on my 90th birthday with a parachute. So the service I shall perform is I will demonstrate the proper use of the parachute for those of you who remain. Next person stepped forward and said, I hold a Ph.D. The doctor philosophy degree is the highest educational achievement in the land. Undoubtedly, that makes me one of the smartest men alive. Took a parachute, jumped out of the plane. That left two passengers for one parachute. An eight to seven year old minister and a young student. The student was seated there wearing a skull cap, sweatshirt, faded jeans, and dirty hiking boots. The minister looked at him and said, my son, I've lived a full and fruitful life. Your accomplishments are yet to be made take the last parachute and be saved. The student said, well, that's all right, Reverend. Neither one of us has to die in an airplane crash. The minister said, well, how could that be? He said, you recall that distinguished gentleman who said he had a PhD, and that made him one of the smartest men alive. He jumped out with my backpack. <laughs> And the moral to that story is degrees alone don't make you smart. Okay? Some of the people for whom I have the greatest amount of respect in this universe did not have the opportunity to get a university degree. When I think about my parents, my mother only went through the eighth grade, my father through the fourth. They grew up outside Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. They used to tell my brothers and sisters and me how they used to cry because they could not attend school. They used to tell us that they would pray for rain during harvest season because if it rained during harvest season, they couldn't work in the fields those days. And that gave them an opportunity to attend school. But make no mistake about it, they were not uneducated, they were self-educated. They have something that you can't get from college. They had volumes of knowledge marked mother wit and common sense. Some of the most profound lessons in my life have come from them. So I stand here telling you that I grew up in a family with 11 children. Yeah, my dad didn't go out much at night. <laughs> but some of the most profound lessons I learned in life didn't come out of college or universities. My mother used to say, Education without common sense is like a load of books on the back of a jackass. 
If you have to choose between education and common sense, choose common sense. But I'm honored to be standing before an audience that got both. You are here because of your education, because of your common sense. My dad used to say that the only fool bigger than the person who thinks he knows it all is the person who argues with him. <laughs> Never argue with a fool because a distant observer may not be able to tell which one is the fool. They used to say that the road to success is always under construction. And every one of you here could write a book by that title. Because you didn't get to sit in the seats in which you are sitting right now by taking roads that were devoid of orange barrels and chuck holes and detours. You had to learn to maneuver around those roads, and you have done that. And what's even more special about you is you share what you have learned, those experiences, with the clients you serve. My folks used to say that a liar has to have an excellent memory, and I didn't know what that meant until I got to be an adult and realized that if you have tell the truth, you don't have to try to remember what you said the last time you were asked a question. But a liar has to struggle to make sure that he or she has consistency. My folks used to say you should live your lives such that even the undertaker will be sorry when you die. If you know the undertakers I know, you know what a challenge that is. <laughs> I have a friend who's an undertaker. He doesn't sign his letters sincerely yours. He signs his letters eventually yours. <laughs> <laughs> but most importantly, they used to say you should get enough education so you never have to look up to anybody. And then get a little bit more so you will be wise enough not to look down on anybody either. So you have to live lives with an abiding sense of humility about you, especially in the roles you serve and the clientele you serve. They have to sense your sincerity, that you are genuine. Within three seconds, those of you who are old enough to recognize this, they will know whether you are live or Memorex. You cannot fake sincerity. You have to have integrity. And that's what you have. That's what you bring here. And I submit that if you have integrity, nothing else matters. If you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. I had the pleasure of being on a program in my hometown of Portsmouth, Virginia, many years ago with Alex Haley. And Alex looked at me and said, Julian, my dad used to say, boy, if you see a turtle sitting atop a fence post, you know it had some help. Now, any number of people have tried to claim that quote, but this was 30 years ago when Alex Haley told me his father said that. So as I was listening to my surrogate son, Will, introduce me, I was thinking about the help I've received. I was thinking about the fact that my bride of over 54 years, Zenobia and I got married at the end of our sophomore year at Norfolk State. I had no degree, owned no automobile, owned no home. My buddies tell me, boy, you had no nothing, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but two years later, when I finished Norfolk State and headed up to Rochester for grad school, we had our firstborn son. And we decided that Zenobia would stay at Norfolk State and complete her undergraduate degree before joining me in Rochester. Years later in Cleveland, by this time we have two sons when we decided that I would go off to the University of Michigan for doctoral studies. A few years after that, when we decided I would go to the Harvard Business School. With our two sons, we decided that Zenobia should not interrupt her career as a Cleveland public school teacher. So she stayed here in Cleveland, taking care of those two sons while I would get home as many weekends as possible. But she would get up in the morning, make sure they got dressed, fix breakfast for them, take one off to daycare, another off to school, go teach a full day of school herself, reverse that process in the afternoon, come home, throw off her coat, kick off her shoes, fix dinner for them. And after dinner, see to it that they did their homework, and when they were in bed, take care of her other 38 children, her students, by correcting papers and calling homes. And she did that to help me achieve. So everywhere I go in this universe, I borrow from Gladys Knight and her used to be pips, if you will, because I tell people if anyone should ever write my life story, for whatever reason there might be, Zenobia will be between each line of pain and glory, because she's the best thing that ever happened to me. 
I tell people she's the chocolate chips in my cookies. <laughs> and I didn't realize how much she had done for me until she went to graduate school and I was stuck with those two deep. <laughs> the lady should be canonized for dealing with those characters. He said, wait a minute. What does all of this have to do with a conference on social work, social welfare? What, what does that, it has everything to do with it because you must always acknowledge those who help you. Don't take it for granted that they know. I know men who say, I don't have to tell my wife I love her. I told her that the day we got married. If I ever change my mind, I'll let her know. But I submit that all the professional success in the universe cannot compensate for a lack of success with the people you love and the people who love you. So with all you do in your professions, make sure that you express appreciation to the support you get from family, from your colleagues. Don't take it for granted that the people with whom you work know that you appreciate what they bring to the table. So that's why I'm so privileged to be standing here in front of you. When Will contacted me and invited me, Will, I'm not going to tell that lie. When Will contacted me and told me I was going to be the speaker, <laughs> you see, I went to the Harvard Business School. Will went to the Pontius Pilate School of Management. I started to ask, why me? But I was dissuaded from that based upon the experience of a friend of mine who was a banquet speaker. During dinner before his speech, he broke his dentures. He became quite concerned because he knew he was not going to be able to go on and give his speech, was going to have to return the check for his fee, which he had already spent. When the MC noticed what had happened, the MC called the speaker aside, looked in his mouth, said, not to worry, I'll be back in a few minutes. Disappeared and came back in about 20 minutes, reached in his pocket, gave the speaker a pair of dentures. The speaker put them in his mouth and they fit perfectly. He was so appreciative, but he was overwhelmed with curiosity. He looked at the MC and said, are you a dentist? The MC said, oh no, I'm just a plain old undertaker. <laughs> and the moral to that story is when good things happen to you, sometimes you're better off not knowing why. <laughs> just keep your mouth shut and be grateful. <laughs> well, it's a good thing I'm here. It's a good thing for me because it is not often physicists get asked to address non-technical topics. And the reason we don't fall squarely on our shoulders. It was made crystal clear to me many years ago when our oldest son was in high school. He asked me for the definition of a human being, but he wanted it in engineering terms. The definition I gave him was a human being is a complete self-contained, totally enclosed power plant available in a variety of sizes and colors and reproducible in quantity. Human beings are relatively long-lived, have major components in duplicate, and science is rapidly making strides towards solving the spare parts problem. Humans are waterproof, amphibious, operate on a wide variety of fuels, enjoy thermostatically controlled temperatures, circulating fluid heat, evaporative cooling, have seal and lubricated bearings, audio and optional direction and range finding, sound and sight recordings, audio and visual communication, and are equipped with a sophisticated control center called a brain. Now, when I was through with that description, it became significant to me for what has been omitted. What goes beyond the mere fact of this robot's existence and turns it into a human being? What makes it differ from such mechanical marvels as the Viking lander, the Pathfinder lander, the spirit and opportunity to rovers on Mars? Ladies and gentlemen, the meaning of being human is the most significant of all subjects. Science will never be able to reduce the value of human commitment to a formula. It will never be able to reduce the value of service one for another, love one for another, never reduce the value of what you do for the clients you serve. Science cannot reduce that to arithmetic. The challenge of accomplishment in living, the depth of insight into beauty and truth, help, support one for another, these things shall always surpass the scientific master of nature. As I told my colleagues at NASA, you can have all the technical knowledge in the world at your fingertips, but if you aren't a caring human being, you're the most dangerous creature on earth and the most unfulfilled. 
So being here, being here among caring human beings, honored and humble. So you know by now, I didn't come here to talk to you in the conceptual, opaque terms of physics, asymptotic freedom, engaged field theories, and conservation of strangers, and rims, and rads, and sievers, and so on endlessly. Many scientists and engineers believe if something is literate, reads easily, and makes good sense, it's of no substance. But if it reads as though just translated from the German, now that's substance. And if it's in the universal foreign language of quantum physics that only three people in the world can understand, it, that's high class substance. No, the high class substance this day is embedded in you. Every one of you here brings so much to this conference. And I congratulate you. I congratulate those who sponsored the conference, the person or people who had the idea for this. Looking at this conference agenda, just bursting with knowledge, skills, abilities, and experiences. But the true significance of this conference is not only in what happens here, it's in what happens when you leave here because of what happens here. And I know you recognize that you have to actively participate. My dad was a little itinerant preacher down in Virginia. He used to tell us the story about a minister who was invited to deliver a sermon at guest minister at a local church. His wife wasn't feeling well, so he took his 10-year-old son with him for the service that morning. Now, I grew up in a Pentecostal church in the South, so some of you might recognize what had happened. I think they took up an offering in the parking lot before the minister got there with his son. In church, they took up of offering for the building fund, for the general offering, for the sacrificial offering, the pastor's aid society offering. <laughs> Then the guest minister was introduced. Following his sermon, the pastor stepped up and said, we are now going to pass the plate for an offering for the guest minister. He sat down and watched the plate going from pew to pew. Towards the back, it was still empty. He beckoned to his 10-year-old son, gave him a $20 bill, and said, son, put this in the plate. Try not to be too conspicuous. After service, the pastor handed the minister an envelope. He walked home with his son, opened the envelope, pulled out, a $20 bill. He looked at his son and said, son, did you learn a lesson from this experience? The little boy said, yes, sir, daddy, I did. He said, what did you learn? He said, daddy, if you had put more in, you would have got more out. <laughs> now you see, that young man have learned one of the most profound lessons of life. Newton's third law of motion says, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That law transcends the realm of physics. If you give of yourself whenever you can and in a way that you can to whomever you can, you will find yourself rewarded in far greater proportion than you've given. If you want to get a lot out of this conference, you have to put a lot in this conference. And I know you, and I know you're capable of doing this. And this, this conference, this is a sterling example to me of what it means when people come together for common good. I'm looking at this, this topic. What happens when everything changes? What happens when everything changes? Now, just between you and me, I served as director of a NASA center. I want you to understand that NASA gets its budget from the United States Congress every year the president submits the budget. We have to wait to see what Congress is going to do. What happens when everything changes? Congress never passed a budget on time. We were always operating under continuing resolution. We were handicapped, handcuffed, because you could start no new programs until your budget was approved. I'll tell you what I learned when budget constraints show up. Number one, I would like to handcuff and put in jail the person who came up with the phrase, you do more with less. <laughs> you don't do more with less. I learned that you do less with less. 
but you prioritize. What you do is look at programs and projects and responsibilities. I call it management by cowardice when someone decrees there will be across the board cuts of 10% or whatever. That's management by cowardice. Because if you look at programs, there are some in times of fiscal constraints that may even merit an increase because of the importance of that segment of the organization to not just the survival, but to the growth of an organization. But you have to have courage to do that. And you have to be willing to listen to the people in the organization. But that means you have to choose the right people in organization. See, what happens so often is when you start to choose someone as the leaders or supervisors, you tend to make the wrong decisions for the wrong reasons. You see, because so often people make decisions like at NASA based upon those people who come into the administration building in the conference room and make presentations. And they prepare. I mean, they get new suits and practice and so forth. And they come in. And what you see, how they treat people from their level up, is one thing. But if you're going to choose people as supervisors, managers, and leaders, you need to also examine how they treat people from their level down. In these lectures I give to executive conferences, I say often organizations are like a bunch of baboons in a tree. That is, those looking down see smiling faces. Those looking up <laughs> some graphic, isn't it? So one of the most critical roles you serve is in how you choose people because that is critical to the survival of an organization, not just in good times, but in bad times. Also, getting input. You see, I don't know anyone who ever took a rental car to the car wash before they turned it in. But watch what happens when it's their own vehicle, especially if it's new. You notice how far away they park at the mall from other cars, won't drive over loose gravel or freshly tarred road. There's a distinct difference in how people treat something when it belongs to someone else than themselves. So every opportunity I had, I involved employees got their input in policies and procedures because that gives people ownership. And when people in an organization have ownership in the decision-making process, when the decisions are made, they tend to treat them much better. So it is extremely important that you, if you have the responsibility for choosing people, choose the right people, and especially when it comes to giving awards. You see, I had people who worked for me who had poor performers, and they would say, well, the way to incentivize the poor performer is give him or her an award for performance. <laughs> now, not only did that give the award to someone who didn't deserve it, but that cheapened the award for those people who do. And you can't fool yourself. Everybody in an organization knows who those poor performers are, and they know who the performers are who are members of the team. But as leaders in an organization, you have an abiding responsibility to help those poor performers become better. You see, so often we take another coward's way out. We only want to deal with the best performers. That's what gives me heartburn about colleges and universities. They take the students who are A students and make little godless out of them. You know, when the VIPs come in, they invite it to the president's house. They're the ones who get the exposure. And those students who struggle and who get C's, who sometimes in life end up hiring the A students late on in life anyway. But you do the best you can. But those students don't get the attention they deserve, which causes me a problem. You hear people say, if a thing is worth doing, it is worth doing well. And that's true. 
but the natural corollary to that gives me heartburn. That is, if you can't do it well, then don't do it at all. That's a lie. Life is not a spectator sport. You can't sit around watching only those people who are good at something do it. Think about it. If only the finest birds in the forest dared to sing, how quiet the forest would be. If only the best readers dared to read, how dumb our nation would be. If only the best athletes engaged in athletics, how weak our nation would be. If only the best readers dared to read, how dumb our nation would be. If only the best lovers dared to make love, where would you and I be? <laughs> I'd be tired myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you got a sense of humor. <laughs> Look, if a thing is worth doing, it is worth doing, period. I tell my physics students, if you take physics and fail it flat on your face, you're a lot closer to the Nobel Prize in physics than those who never took the course. If you go out for wrestling and get pinned in three seconds, in your first match, you are a lot closer to the wrestling championship than those who never got on the mat. You cannot learn to swim without getting wet, getting in the game. That's what we have to do. And we have to have all hands on deck in organizations, respect and value all people. And I look around this room and I'll tell you what, I'm so pleased to see the diversity in this organization because that's super critical too. Now you can imagine a NASA Glenn Research Center with all these highfalutin PhDs, et cetera, and you start talking about diversity and they want to say, well, wait a minute, how is that relevant to my research? Diversity is relevant to every aspect of life. If you want the best results, you need all input. And as a nation, if we are going to move forward and make progress and, and be a superpower in this global competition, we cannot afford to overlook the resource that's in every one. You want the broadest spectrum of ideas in every process, in every decision that you're about to make. So not only is it important to value diversity, but you must seek diversity. The other thing is I look at the composition of this audience, all the different organizations represented. Coming together for common good, for common cause. See, there was a visitor to an insane asylum. The visitor noticed there were only three guards watching over 100 inmates. The visitor looked at one of the guards and said, aren't you afraid these inmates will overpower you and escape? The guard said, no, you see, lunatics never unite. Sheer lunacy. If we don't learn to unite, to come together, using the model that you've set here, coming together, working for good solutions, common goods, that's what's special about you in this audience. And remember, Insane asylums and universities, both are mental institutions. <laughs> the difference is you have to show certifiable progress to get out of an insane asylum. <laughs> okay. Each one here can make a difference. Everyone who has come here again has brought something with you and everyone who's come here has brought something with you somebody else can use. Too often we say, what can I do as one person? It was Socrates who said of idealism, whether the city of God does exist or ever will exist on earth, the wise man will pattern himself after the manner of that city and in so doing will set his own house in order. And each individual has to be about that business. And that's what you are doing here today, helping set this city, this county, this state, this nation's house in order. That's what you are doing. You see, the kind of work you do has to be homegrown. We can't go abroad 
to get what you do. That has to be delivered by you and through you. And you should have a great sense of pride in just that. So my final thoughts relate to the commitment that we all have to make and make to youth. All the years, 40 years I worked at NASA, I taught part-time, I taught at Tri-C before there was a Tri-C, okay? I wanted to teach math and physics, beginning math and physics, because I maintain you don't need the best teachers teaching heat and thermodynamics. By the time a student gets there, he or she can really teach them themselves. So it was critical for me to reach out and to teach the students at those entry levels. And I always tried to teach a little of the history of physics to make the course learnable and relevant. On one test after 10 problems, I gave a bonus question. I wrote, what can you tell me about the great physicists of the 18th century? One student wrote, they're all dead. <laughs> Whatever well, second time I learned the lesson I'll share with you. I was invited to give a lecture at Purdue University. The first time I went, I flew into Indianapolis, picked up a rental car, was driving to West Lafayette, and got lost. Pulled over to the side of the road, trudged out in the field where there was a farmer, asked the farmer, uh, what's the quickest way to get to West Lafayette from here? He said, are you walking or driving? I said, I'm driving. He said, that's the quickest way to get there. <laughs> what I learned is in life, it is often more important to know the right questions to ask than it is to know the right answers. So when this young woman wrote that answer, I realized she answered the question I'd asked. But I suggested to her that she should go on and get a four-year degree, bachelor's degree. She said, well, I'm not sure I can do that. She said, uh, I'm a single parent, two children. I can only come to school in the evening when my mother gets home to take care of my children. I'm from a broken home myself. And I said, wait a minute, young lady, let me destroy a lie that permeates this nation. That lie of a broken home, a broken home is not a home with a single parent. A broken home is a home without love. Too many successful people have been reared by single parents for us to start labeling them at risk and throw away and this kind of nonsense. Young lady, this is something, if you want to do it, if you work to do it, if you will to do it, you can do this. She said, well, how long would it take me going part-time to get that degree? I said, well, maybe eight or nine years. She said, nine years? Do you know how old I will be in nine years? My response was, young lady, you will be the same age in nine years, whether or not you attend college. But nine years from now, you'll look back and say, if I had started then, I would be through by now. And our sons say, if your aunt were a man, she would be your uncle. You can live if your life away. The world is full of couldas and wouldas and shouldas, if only. Never let yourself get caught at any point in life saying how much better off you would be if you had done something that was under your control in the first place. She said, I'm too old to start working on a degree. I reminded her that the Roman scholar Cato started to study Greek when he was 80 years old. Someone asked, why would you start to study a different language at such an advanced age? Cato said, 80 is the earliest age I have left to start. <laughs> and your age, as you sit where you are now, is the earliest age you have left to decide to do some of the things that you want to do. It might be a different language. It might be playing a musical instrument, an exercise program. You don't have to run marathons, but walking 20, 30 minutes a day, four or five times a week. Now is the earliest time you have to make that decision. And working with young people, volunteering. I hear people say, well, you know, I'm not a professional educator. And you ask me to tutor and teach. I reminded them that the Titanic was built by professionals. 
the ark was built by amateurs. You know the difference in the results, right? <laughs> so you don't have to be a professional to give. I also say that when you're dealing with young people like you're dealing with your client, you have to park your ego by the door. You see, so often we get so impressed. I, I learned a lesson when I was hired to be a consultant for a nuclear power plant company. They wanted to locate a nuclear plant in the state of South Carolina. So they gave me a nice fat consultant's contract to go around the state giving lectures on the biological effects and the environmental effects of ionizing radiation. They also provided a chauffeur-driven limousine. Every time I would go into South Carolina, no matter where it was, this chauffeur would be there with that limousine taking me to the towns where I had to speak. One night he looked at me and said, you know, Dr. Earls, I've heard you give that lecture so often I could give it myself. I said, surely you jest. He said, I'm serious. I said, well, I'll tell you what. They don't know me in this little town. <laughs> okay. I stand in the back of the auditorium as a chauffeur. You go up front and you deliver the lecture. He said, no problem. He went up front and delivered the lecture verbatim punctuatum. As a matter of fact, he did it so well, he finished a few minutes earlier than I would finish when I gave the lecture. <laughs> At this occurrence, the MC stepped forward and said, well, Dr. Earls finished a little earlier than we thought. So we have time for a few questions from there. <laughs> oh, I smiled, okay? Later stood up and said, well, Dr. Earls, I think you define the Rentgen as that amount of X or gamma radiation such that the associated corpuscular emission per gram of air at standard temperature in practice is one electrostatic unit of charge of either sign. But you didn't say how that differs from the rim and the rad. I smiled even broader. The chauffeur looked down, dropped his head, and said in my entire career, that's probably the easiest question I think I've ever heard. As a matter of fact, it's so simple, I'm gonna let my chauffeur in the back of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Education is more than classrooms and laboratories. You are educators because you touch lives. I can learn from everyone. From that chauffeur, reminded what my dad used to say, that God did not give anybody everything but he gave everybody something. And our responsibility is to cultivate, develop that something that is in everyone and help them do that. So to do that, I want you to take care of yourselves. You're all giving people, but everyone in here is flown and you watch the flight attendant stand before you and say, during an emergency, the oxygen mask will drop from overhead. And what did they tell you to do? First put it over your mouth, and then someone who's traveling with you who needs help. You extrapolate that to life. That means you can't help anyone without first helping yourself. And I don't mean that in a selfish manner. But do something good for yourself. Ladies, when you go home, you know, attack the closets. Throw out those ugly little sisters, Polly and Esther, okay? <laughs> go buy yourself something nice because women, women will tell you that clothes left in the closet a long time shrink. Guys, go attack your closet. Guys, go you know, throw away Nehru jackets. They're not going to come back in time. Do something nice for yourself because then you are able to help others. And the final word that I have for you is to be patient and persistent in what you do. You're not always going to get the results you seek. But be patient and be persistent. Nothing in this world can beat that. I won't tell you how much I weighed before I started running. Zenova used to say to me, Julian, you are not going to lose, you're not going to live long enough to see our sons grow into adulthood if you don't lose weight. Nothing she said made a difference to me. 
But one day I was standing in the grocery store in the checkout line wearing my pager. Yeah, there was something called a pager back in the day. <laughs> well, when my tages, pager started to beat rather loudly, the little boy behind me, about five years old with his mother, my pager started to beep. The little boy grabbed his mama and said, look out, mama, the fat man is backing up. <laughs> now that was the inspiration I needed <laughs> to motivate me to put the hostess cupcakes and the tweakers back up on the shelf and decide that I needed an exercise, I needed to change. People say change is difficult. Change is not difficult. The easiest thing in the world to do is to change. But sustaining change is where there's the challenge. Calvin Coolidge said it in better than anyone. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Talent alone will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Education alone will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Staying with it, stick to it makes and carries the day. You know, it's only logical. But I shouldn't use that term because I teach courses in logic. And one student asked me, well, Dr. Earls, how do you observe logic in everyday occurrences? What does that mean to you? I said, well, I get discouraged. For example, you talk about logic. Why do you press harder on the remote control when you know the batteries are dead? <laughs> if those psychics know the lottery numbers, why don't they just play them? Have you ever wondered why they have interstate highways in Hawaii? <laughs> ever wonder why they have Braille on drive through ATMs at banks? <laughs> and I love Western movies. One night I'm watching these movies and the cowboys jumping up and down. Z, Z, Z says when she comes home, she knows I'm there because she hears pop, pop, pop on the TV when she opens the door. I'm watching these cowboy movies when suddenly it occurred to me watching cowboys jumping up and down on the back of horses. If logic truly prevailed, women would straddle horses and men would ride side saddle. <laughs> but I congratulate you for never letting anything or feel with the logic you bring to what you do every single day. And stay with it, no matter how tough it gets, no matter the disappointment. We need you. And the closing advice I give is the judge who gave the 80-year-old man 30 years in prison. When he cried pathetically, Your Honor, I won't live long enough to serve such a sentence. She said, that's all right. Just do what you can. <laughs> Thank you very much. I told you, you in for a treat. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Earls. Um, I don't really know what else to say, but thank you. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to just say thank you and shut up. That was one of the takeaways, so thank you, Doc. I appreciate it. Um, so before we uh, break into the, uh, the next sessions, Dr. Earls, I'm going to ask you to come back up if that's okay. We're just going to have a few minutes of questions and answers, if, you're, if your schedule permits. Um, we're going to uh, have a couple of, of wireless microphones. We know that, that change and uncertainty is such a common occurrence, but we all have different perspectives and experiences. And uh, I think this is a tremendous opportunity to, to learn more uh, from Dr. Earls and related to our own experience. Thank you for such an excellent, excellent presentation. And I want to say that we must be brother and sister because I say to Will all the time, he is my nephew. <laughs> uh, but we, 
we certainly are witnessing uh, times of real uncertainty right now with a lot that's going on uh, at the federal level. What wisdom can you share with us that would help us to remain, at, I don't know, more optimistic in getting through what we anticipate to be horrific times over the next few years? I'll start with what my dad used to say, this too shall pass, all right? So firstly, you keep that at the forefront. But what I say is that each individual has to understand from that Socrates quote about one person making a difference. What you have to do as an individual is speak out against injustice everywhere, every time you see it. You have to make voices heard as individuals, as collectives, as groups, uh, one of our Jewish brothers and sisters, both in spirit and in blood, Eli Wiesel said, silence encourages the oppressor, never the oppressed. Neutrality encourages the tormentor, never the victim. And I maintain that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who maintain their silence and neutrality during a period of moral crisis. So speak out individually and collectively and join groups that represent the philosophy and the position that you need to take, write some checks to, to you know, NAACP, ACLU, all those organizations and be supportive in that way. We can make a difference, all right? All right, Dr. Earls, if I could ask you to talk about um, a theme from this morning was the importance of um, coalition building and standing in solidarity with people who you might have common points of intersection with. Could you talk about the importance of collaboration um, when achieving systemic change? Uh, there's an African proverb that says, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. And that's a message, and that's what I see here. Um, my granddaddy used to talk, um, use an example about, he would ask a, ask a farm boy to come up with a stick and break the stick, and he would break it over his knee. Then he would take a bunch of sticks and put them in a bundle and put a, 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 a slip from a rubber tire around them and have this bundle of sticks and say, break them. And it was next to impossible. Fairly single-minded example, but you extrapolate that to what that means to us. And that is the power that comes from unity. Uh, one lecture I give, I talk about the lessons that we can learn from from geese flying in a V formation. Uh, <clears throat> you see, people often say when we talk about animals, they say, well, you know, you're behaving like an animal, and sometimes that's an insult to the animal kingdom. <laughs> but you notice the lessons that you learn from, from geese. Flying in a V formation, geese can fly 7-8% 7 greater distance in the V formation than each goose flying alone. You extrapolate that to life, that means we can go a lot further by working together. If one goose drops out of formation, it experiences drag and quickly gets back into formation. The message from there, it is much more difficult doing something working alone than working with others. When you hear geese honking, they're the geese in back honking for encouragement for the geese up front to keep up the pace. In life, we have to not use honking as discouragement. We have to raise our voices for encouragement for those of us working together. When one goose gets sick or ill and drops out of formation, 
two geese drop out of formation and stay with the ill or wounded goose until it gets better or it dies before they try to catch up with another, that formation or another one. We have to drop out periodically before our colleagues who are experiencing trouble and difficulty drop out and help them. When the lead goose gets tired, it rotates back into formation and another goose takes the lead. The message for us is shared leadership. How often in organizations do we take the same people and work them to a frazzle? And if you are one of those, you know how you just say, look, somebody else needs to take the lead. But then when they fall back, you know you don't want to see it fail, so you do that. So I gave that lecture one time in a group of students, and one said, well, Dr. Earl, why is one leg of the V always longer than the other? I said, that's because there are more geese on that side. <laughs> you see, in life, often, we spend so much time making the simple complex when what we ought to do is spend time try, trying to make the complex simple. I'm sorry for that long answer, but you hit my hot button, as you could tell. I won't, all right. Yes. Okay. I'll go later. Excuse me. Thank you. Excuse me. Sorry. Dr. Earls, um, can you tell me if Cleveland State is doing anything to encourage its students to um, challenge the higher education budget? Yes, and not only are the students, but we are as well. I went to Cleveland State as executive in residence as a College of Business Administration. But I really served the entire university. And I spent all kinds of time working with students, especially trying to increase students in the STEM areas. Uh, just this morning, I was at a conference that Congresswoman Marsha Fudge sponsored at a corporate college that was stream science, technology, engineering, recreation, math, and the arts. So yes, getting student groups together. A friend of mine left Cleveland State and took a job in Cincinnati. So I stand here as the reluctant vice president for university engagement and chief diversity officer, working with Cleveland State to try to address what happens to us. And, and the example I give is we are wrestling with these budgetary constraints. How many people run for governors and political office saying they want to be champions of education, and the first thing they do is cut education. I give lectures to teachers around the state, and they talk about professions exams and so forth. You know, the story I tell is three people arguing over whose profession was first established. The engineer stepped forward and said, my profession was the first profession that was established because you read your Bible, it says in six days the earth was created out of chaos. That was a massive engineering feat. The physician stepped forward and said, no, mine was, because you read that same Bible, it says Eve was carved with a rib from Adam. That was a medical procedure, which makes my profession the first. The politician stepped up and said, wait a minute, who do you think created the chaos in the first place? And that's what we are getting too often from people in political office who run on a platform of wanting to serve and get elected and want to be served and want to make decisions without involving, want to, don't take the car to the car wash. They don't want to ask the people who are impacted to provide input about policies and procedures. They want to sit there and do that themselves. If I tell the teacher, when it comes to proficiency exam, the first thing we ought to do is administer proficiency exam to every single member of the state legislature and then publish the results in the newspapers the next day. <laughs> Look, I better stop and give you time to do some useful work here <laughs> rather than listen to me. Thank you have been absolutely beautiful as an audience. I really am appreciative and humbled by your response and your reaction. And I know I tell a lot of stories, but I hope what you do is remember the point that was made associated with the story. Because humor, just for the sake of humor, from my perspective, is, not, is useless. But if it helps to make a point more valid, then that's what I strive to do. And your reaction gives me some comfort that 
I probably did a little better than I usually do with that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>